we can begin with a word of prayer. <coughs> Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can meet together to study your word. We give thanks for the light that you've been sharing with us concerning chronology, concerning Mullerite history, and that we can now access dates in the past through the technology that has been provided and information within the internet that helps us to attain information which is pertinent to our time. And Father, we give thanks for your amazing love which has given us a hope and a future. We pray that our sins be cast into the sea of forgetfulness and we be cleansed and pure before you. Help me to present this year message in a way which is clear and that your people can understand it and be benefited and be blessed by it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is my fourth presentation. I began with the, the idea of that we are approaching the chronology of chronologies. God has provided light to Usher, but there was mistakes there. And Miller he used Usher's chronology to some extent, but he, uh, he had further light in chronology, the dates of 457 BC, for example. And he also was led to understand many of the time spans that we find in the book of Daniel and Revelation. And I just want to share sort of an idea that I touched on. I had the idea that Usher was representing the outer court and Miller, he was taking God's people through the use of chronology from uh, the holy place uh, towards the holies of holies. And I noted that from Exodus chapter 26, uh, we have some <coughs> verses which describe the, the boards that you, we find in the tabernacle. I've read from verse, I have some verses here that are, I've missed out verses 17 and 19, but this is just the basics to get the, the information concerning the boards. And verse 15 says, And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shit and wood standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. And thou shalt make the boards of the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side, southward, and for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be twenty boards. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. And two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. So we have in total forty-six boards, which are one point. Uh, five cubits. And Millerite history, we normally identify the first angel's message uh, arriving on, se revi revi sorry, arriving in 1798 and extending uh, to uh, October 22nd, 1844. And that's a period of 46 years. 46 years is connected to the number of a temple uh, that was mentioned in John chapter 2, when Jesus had cleansed the sanctuary. Uh, they referred to the, the temple there was 40 and 6 years in building. Now, in this here we have, uh, in a sense, two additional boards, but they, for us, for the most holies of holies, or the holy of holies, or the most holy place, uh, these would have to be in the region of uh, half half a cubit each, for that to be uh, 10 cubits. So the understanding is, in Solomon's temple, it was 
20 cubits by 20 cubits was the dimensions of the most holy place. And here we find, well, there's a statement by Ellen White. She says that that temple was built in the same dimensions as the tabernacle, but to a greater extent. And here we find that there's a 10 cubit um, size being mentioned concerning these here boards. And so that would be, uh, you have six boards there on the western side, and these were 1.5 cubits. So if, in total, that would be, for them, six boards would be a total of nine cubits. So therefore, the, these other two boards, for that to be 10 cubits, would have to be uh, half a cubit each in length. <coughs> so that's my, maybe a suggestion for connecting the chronology of Mother to the holy place and taking us into the most holy place. Just another point. Um, the fact, if you consider an 18-inch cubit and you do the calculation of 20 times 18 for the the north side, 20 times 18 for the south side, and 6 times 18 for the western side, plus uh, half a cubit each would be 9 inches in either side. You have also uh, the number of 126 inches for the length of all these here boards uh, going round about. So I'm, I just want to review a little bit more as well of just what I shared. We have these here happening, is that okay? I stopped sharing, I was gonna use the whiteboard. Okay, thank you. So I had, in the next presentation after that, I was looking to establish a general chronology from about the time of the Babylonian captivity. And as far as I got was until the, around the time of the, the Exodus. And then the following uh, presentation, I did touch on a period of 430 years uh, but that we find with that we find uh, within connection with uh, Abraham. And a period, that's called a period of sojourning. And then there's a period of 400 years, which uh, takes us to the time when Isaac was five years old, and then he was mocked by Ishmael. And that began a period of uh, affliction. And so 400 years is deals with affliction and the 430 years deals with the period of sojourning that takes us to the time of the Exodus. And I had discussed the year nine, 597, and we had this year date, the 16th of March, and this was the second day of the 12th month. And this was relating to the captivity of Jehoiachin. And there's an archaeological tablet that has been found that testifies to this year date. And he, uh, Jehoi Jehoiachin had only ruled about, it says like three months and ten days. So that would take us into around December of 598 BC, and he's then taken captive on the 16th of March, 597. And from this year date, we can project, sort of springboard, I'll use the term, uh, to find other uh, chronologies or other dates and to align with events. And from this year date, uh, it was on the t we can calculate that what would have been the 12th year? Uh, well, 
You can calculate, well, I think it's the ninth year of Zedekiah who follows him when the siege begins in 587. Um, that siege ends on that's Zedekiah's ninth year. And it ends in Zedekiah's 11th year. In 586. And that's the time of the destruction of the temple. And we can count the years of the kings of Judah, including taking account of the two years of co-regency and the, the time of Jehoshaphat and his son Jehoram. They co-reigned for two years. And that was a period of 391 years and about six months. And Ezekiel gives another testimony of 390 years from the beginning of the siege in 587. And so you have 18 months in here, approximately, till the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the siege. And these here two dates take us to the dividing of the kingdom in 977. And from there, we can count the reigns of Saul, David, and Solomon, which would uh, comes to 120 years. That takes us to 977 BC. And the temple, should be making use of these lines. <laughs> it's not very straight. Okay, and there's also 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Gives us a period of 480 years from the fourth year of Solomon. So Solomon reigns 40 years. So his fourth year there would leave a period of 36 years here. And then we have the two 80 years for the reigns of Saul and David, 40 years each. And from this year, fourth year, we can project springboard in the sense back to when they come out of Egypt, uh, come out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, 480 years. And that would take us to 1493 BC. And this year date would be 1013 BC. Now there's some, I haven't, uh, I sort of give you some scriptures. As I mentioned Psalm 114 and Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 36. And these here provide some evidence that they didn't come out of Egypt until they had actually crossed the River Jordan. Now there's other scriptures that would testify they came out of Egypt 40 years prior, in 1533 BC, at the crossing of the Red Sea. But there's, the evidence is, uh, I have to still prove further, uh, give further evidence that this here uh, is the date of the Exodus. But what I want to share with you is concerning 1493 BC, which also testifies um, to this here chronology being correct, and that relates to the ceasing of the manna. So this was a, for, a period of 40 years. Now, uh, if we read Exodus chapter 16, verse 1, so I'm going to ask maybe uh, Theodore, would you like to read that for me, please? Chapter 16? Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. Okay. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so it then deals with them murmuring after that, and then God says he's going to give them bread. 
from heaven. Um, so the next day, the manna's going to fall. So there's a verse there. We can, you can maybe read and find that for me, please, or we'll connect with that. Well, yes, so um, in verse 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in. It shall come to pass. And it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses said unto, and Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. Right. So they're going to be this murmuring, and then you're going to have, uh, um, they want flesh to eat, right? So they're mm -hmm. going to have this, these uh, birds come, the quails, right? Mm -hmm. And so then the next morning there's going to be uh, this small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. Um, and they call it manna because that means, what is it? Mm -hmm. So that's... Um, so that obviously would begin on the... So that obviously would, would, did we record that at all? Was my mic on? Um, I think it's probably audible. Okay, anyway, because I don't, I don't think it was. Um, so I'll just read that again. Um, so it's Exodus 16.1. They took their journey from Elam, and the congregation of the children of Israel came out of the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month. They're going to murmur against Moses, and then he says that he's going to rain bread from heaven. So they want flesh. He's going to give them flesh, but he's also going to give them manna. And so the idea is that that's going to begin on the next day, which is the 16th day, which is going to be the first day of the week. And the manna is going to fall for six days. And then on the sixth day, they're going to gather twice as much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we have a date here, the 16th day of the second month, and this would have to be a Sunday. If the chronology is going to be accurate to matching 1533 BC. And there is some diagrams. You can go to the calendar converter and you can type in this year, Julian date, minus 1533 BC. And you will indeed find that the, the 16th day of the second month is a Sunday. And the 15th day, when they arrived in wilderness, was obviously then a Sabbath. So the, the man is going to begin to fall on this year day. And I want to then uh, ask you to read about the time in 1493 BC, 40 years later, that we find, for instance, in, if you go first of all to Joshua, chapter 4, verse 19. And read that first for me, please. And the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Okay, so we have here this is the time when they've just crossed, they, they, well, they, they do cross the river, Jordan at this year time. And it's on the 10th day of the first month. And then if you were to read the following verses, they are going to circumcise uh, those who were not circumcised of the children of Israel. And then you can maybe continue from verse 5, sorry, chapter 5, verse 8. To verse 12 for me, please. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes, 
and parched corn in the self same day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay, thank you. So we have the 14th day of the first month would be the last day that the manna fell. They're going to have, it talks about having a Sabbath on the 15th day of the first month. And so the next day, the 16th day of the first month is when the manna is going to cease. Now, for that there, it would have to be then this 15, sorry, 1493 BC. It would have to make sense then that this uh, 15th day would be a Sabbath. Now, some people think that's relating to the, the Sabbath of the unleavened bread. So, could it be referring to that? So that, that means that it could be any day of the week. Or it could be, is it referring to the actual seventh day Sabbath? Therefore, the 16th day of the first month would have to be a Sunday. And the 14th day of the first month would have to be a Friday. And, and, and one of the things that, that we noticed is that when you look at the period of the manna, it's going to be 40 years less a month, Right? Yes. And so, um, in trying to work this out, if this was indeed just the 15th day of the first month being uh, uh, a sabbat, uh, like the Sabbath of, you know, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, there's actually no way that that could work out unless it happened to also be a Sabbath. So, the point is that the Sabbath is 40 years later, less a month, also the the day before the first uh, before the uh, before first fruits which is the day before first fruits is the feast of unleavened bread so it it sort of negates that argument that people have tried to make uh, and I'm sure you're going to explain it better than that well I'll, go, I'll start sharing the screen again is that okay my notes. Okay, so um, Theodore had mentioned to us there Joshua 4, verse 19. So the children of Israel crossed the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. They're then going to circumcise those who were not circumcised uh, prior to entering or uh, crossing the Jordan. And then in verse 10, Oh, sorry, after, sorry, after circumcising the people, they keep the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. As with the date of the crucifixion, this Passover in the, years four, in the year 1493 BC uh, was from Thursday evening to sunset Friday. The manna would have fell on that Friday morning with the people collecting a mount for that day and the following Sabbath. So if you go to the calendar of the converter, we have there the Julian date, 1493 BC, and it's May the 3rd. And we have there confirming that it's a Friday, and there's the first month, the 14th day, so then on the Sabbath, being the morrow, or the 15th day of the month, after the Passover, on the 14th, they did eat the old corn of the land, which had been prepared as unleavened cakes, and they ate the parched corn in the same self day, the manna ceased. So this is equating to the 16th day 
of the month that the manna ceased. And we are then summarily told that on the morrow, so is that? Which is the 16th? Yeah, the 16th. After they had eaten the old, the old corn on the land, on the 15th the manna uh, ceased neither. Is that all that? You're putting the wrong emphasis. <laughs> Yeah, so what you what it says, equating the 16th day of the month, right, that's referring to uh, the, the day that the manna ceased. We then summarily told that on the morrow, the 16th, after they had eaten the cor old corn of land, on the 15th, right, the manna ceased, neither had the children of Israel manna anymore. So the idea is that on the 16th, if they go out to gather manna, there is none. Mm-hmm. Yes, okay, thank you for clarifying me. I was getting confused. Um, so in Joshua 5, verse 11, it is generally understood that the selfsame day equates with the morrow after the Passover. However, the structure of the Hebrew grammar... Uh, is that a typo you've made there? An exhibits? The structure and exhibits... The structure of the Hebrew grammar, I don't know why it says and, yes, exhibits I, what is known as a proleptic sign. And so I, I took this here from your paper. Maybe that's yeah, a typo you need to fix. <laughs> just check that out. So it's a type of repeat, repeat in the large. So it's just sort of saying um, that the parched corn is eaten on the self-same day, which would be referred to the 16th and not the morrow after the Passover. Um, is that correct? Well, yeah, so that would, the morrow after the Passover would be the 15th. So simply eating the, the corn, the parched corn is shown to occur the day after they had eaten the old corn of the land, being which the, the same day that the manna ceased, and the same day at the 16th upon which the manna first fell. Um, so you also note that though the way of offering is not directly mentioned here, it is implied since only then could they eat of the newly harvested grain. So I have a diagram there that makes it a wee bit more clearer. So you have there the 14th day of the first month, the Passover. It's the last day of the manna falling. You have a double portion. 15th day of the first month, they ate the old corn of the land and then 11 cakes. And then the 16th day of the first month, you have the Feast of First Fruits. It's a Sunday. The manna ceased. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat the fruit of the land of Canaan, and that was the parched corn in the self-same day that the manna ceased. So an understanding that the manna ceased on a Sunday helps us to give clarity to that which Moses had been given to communicate to the children of Israel when they were to enter the promised land. So this is from Leviticus chapter 23, 23 verses 10 to 11. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, and ye reap the harvest thereof, then shall ye bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and ye shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. <clears throat> so, They've came into the land. This is referring to the Feast of First Fruits. There's going to be a Sabbath prior to the 16th day of the first month here uh, that we can see. And it does line up with the seventh day Sabbath. Now, some people will say this is referring to the Sabbath of unleavened bread. But we can see there, chronology wise, it's the Sabbath, it's not just. Any particular Sabbath, um, it's specifically referring to the seventh day Sabbath. Is that how you understand it then? Yeah. Is there anything more you want to add to that? Yeah, so the, the, the idea is that um, the manna ceases on a Sunday. Now, the position that I took before that Seventh day Adventists take is that then when it talks about the morrow after the Sabbath, it's referring to 
the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But there's no evidence that you can take that term, the Sabbath, in Hebrew, to refer to anything other than the weekly Sabbath. And so this was something I'd noted, uh, but when you had mentioned the period for the falling of the manna, which I'd never thought of calculating, when we looked at it, I saw that it indeed was the seventh day sa Sabbath, and that is when the first time they enter the promised land is what he's referring to in Leviticus 23. Now, when it says that you're going to keep it on the self same day, from then on, when you keep the wave offering, it will always be on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. And in Levitic in two different places, one place when they count Pentecost, they count it as, as weeks. Another place they count it as Sabbaths. They count it as Sabbaths the first time because it's literally the Sabbaths. But in the other place, they use the word for weeks because after that, it's not going to always fall on, on the Sabbath. So it'll always fall on the morrow after the Feast of Unleavened Bread ever after, but not always on the day after the weekly Sabbath. But the first time it does. And this was a real revelation. One is in a period of 200 years in which people generally tend to place the Exodus, there's only eight times that you could ha have a year, eight possible years that would meet this condition. Mm -hmm. So it really narrows it down to when you can have the Exodus. And we happen to have one of those eight times in a period of 200 years before we had even thought of counting the manna. Mm -hmm. We were just, we just had to have one that the, the manna fell on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a Sunday the first time. Mm -hmm. But we could have picked years where it would have fell there on the first time, but not cease on the morrow after the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And so, so this was in God's providence. Um, and it came to us at a time in which it was meaningful to us as well, the understanding of it. Mm -hmm. So this is wrote basically when they had the Sinai manifestation of God, the power, soon after that. So this is, I think this is referring to, uh, yes, I think they had arrived in Sinai, you had that manifestation. And so God has some foresight here because they were going to go into the promised land. They were meant to be going in the following year. Yeah, so if they had gone in when they originally were thinking of going in, um, it wouldn't have worked out. So mm -hmm. God obviously had foreseen uh, their their time in the wilderness because he writes this like 39 years or whatever before, yes. 40 years before, uh, they actually uh, crossed the Jordan. Mm -hmm. But it just happens to be that that's... And, and maybe it would be, uh, you know, who knows how it would have happened otherwise. It, it's hard to say. But God definitely foresaw this, which is pretty remarkable. And that we, nobody really notices this. That is, mm -hmm. In searching it up, I found one person who, who even tries to attempt it. And, and they don't quite get it right. Um, one is, it, it doesn't really work out in the year that they have because they don't understand the biblical calendar properly. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, thank you. So, I'll just sort of repeat that again. Some argue that the Sabbath here in question is not a weekly Sabbath, but the Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would fall on any day of the week, but always on the 15th day of the first month. The statement, when you come into the land, implies that this is relating to just the first occasion upon entering the land and, the, and that the circumstance would occur where the first, where the first fruits would be waived the day after the weekly Sabbath. God foresaw that the Feast of First Fruits would be first celebrated on a Sunday. So the instruction continued by saying, and ye shall neither, and ye shall neither, and ye, sorry, and ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought ye brought an offering unto the Lord your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So I think we had that sort of like in the wrong place for what I was addressing. 
So the manna initially fell on the 16th day, nearly 40 years prior, being on the second month, uh, the, and that would be uh, the second month in 1533 BC, and then it falls on the 16th day of the first month. Uh, so the total time which the manna fell was 14,587 days, including uh, the last Sabbath day. Um, so that, I think that's, um, well, it wouldn't have fallen on the Sabbath, so I don't know. <laughs> is that right? It, it's or, an inclusive count. So if you yes. count from the day it first fell, which is a Sunday, to the day it last fell, which is a Friday, yes. and you, you just count the fact that, the, you know, there's obviously Sabbaths, it's not following, but you're just counting the period of time. Yes. The period of time is 14,587 days, or 2,084 weeks. Yes. So there was 2,084 Sabbaths when the manna did not fall, 2,084 preparation days when a double portion was collected, and 10,420 days when the manna fell, needing to be eaten on the same day. The midpoint of the period of the falling of the manna is again the first day of the week and the 16th day of the month in 1513. BC. So I have a diagram just showing that. So, so it's 20 years either side of when the manna began to fail, began to fall, and to when it ceased to fall. Um, 700, sorry, 7,294 days in neither side uh, takes us to the midpoint. And that, again, is a Sunday, and it's the 16th day of the first month in 1533 BC, which is uh, quite interesting. 1513, yeah. yeah. So we can divide this here, 14,587 days, into 14,400 plus 187, so you've a symbol there of 144,000 plus 187 days, which is uh, the period of the second angel's message, uh, its arrival, and it's taking you to the third. So um, I just want to stop sharing again. Again, just uh, I noticed a point that Dwight had mentioned Glacier View as well, and just from the board. So. Just tell me again, you mentioned the 11th of August, 18, sorry, 1980? Yeah. So Glacier View starts on the 10th of August, which is the Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to end on the Friday, which is uh, August 15th, the day of the midnight cry. And that's going to be you know, when Desmond Ford gets his credentials removed. So they vote on the 15th to remove his credentials after they examine mm -hmm. him, you know, his teachings. Um, now, I'm converted on August 11th uh, in the evening, just during the Perseid meteor shower, which is the most spectacular per Perseid meteor shower in history. And I was in the location where you would see the height of the meteor shower just after twilight had ended, mm -hmm. so about 11 o'clock at that time, and I watched it for several hours. Um, and in a location where it was completely clear and there was no uh, light, because it was in uh, the mm -hmm. interior of British Columbia. And mm -hmm. um, so I watched it, and it was pretty spectacular. And that's why I can pin down when I was converted, mm -hmm. uh, because that, that was the the day I knew I was converted was that night of the Perseids. So it happens to align with the glacier view. 
But um, so if you count inclusively from the day I was converted to July 18th, that's going to be 14,587 days. But if you count from Glacier View itself, just a cardinal count, it would again give you that 14,587 or 14,588 uh, if you did an inclusive count, right? So, yes. so that we can count it two different ways there. So you could maybe align with the ceasing of the mana. You have the mana falling and the quail falling. Mm -hmm. And then you have the stars falling. <laughs> With the glacier view, maybe? Just... Yeah, and then you still have it going from glacier view from, uh, you know, the 10th to the 15th. So that's going to be six days that, the, you know, technically that they're mm -hmm. going to have until they get the double portion. But here, this is, uh, it's almost like a mirror in some way to what, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the, obviously Desmond Ford and what happens at glacier view, I mean, it is in some way connected to the Adventist church and these false doctrines and what July 18th represents, uh, but also for me personally to my conversion. So it's kind mm -hmm. of interesting in that, in that way. But to find that, uh, that this movement could discover this point um, is only because of all the tools that God has given us in analyzing chronology and dates, and other people would not be able to, to recognize any of this. Even even in in the Bible itself, people people just say you know I've seen people say it's you know 494 months and I only have um, but you know people often have different views on how that works. So there's so many controversies. They're not really just trying to lay it out and understand it. They're usually trying to prove some point, mm -hmm. and, and obviously their point wouldn't be proven if they understood it properly because they have the wrong date for the Exodus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not going to work out. So obviously they can't work it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Dwight brought up something which just kind of clicked with me uh, concerning that uh, glacier view. So so we have here. I'll just say in this period anyway. I'm not putting any specific date. You could maybe put the 10th of August or, let's just say, 19, August 1980. Um, say 10 or 11. I'm not, I'm sort of not being too exact there. And so we've taken to July 18, 2020. Uh, we have that same period with the, the mana, 14,587 days. And what I picked up on Dwight's presentation was that he said, he was mentioning this here, 1150, in relation to Antiochus Epiphanes. And that was part of the, the controversy there. And now, for me, I sort of connect it with uh, an observation I had made with uh, July 18, 2020. And what I noticed, I'll actually do it this way, down here. So 1,150 days takes us to the 11th of September, uh, 2023, so a couple of months away, ahead of us, and 1150 days prior to that takes us to the 25th of May, uh, 20. 17. You could write this here as, yeah, or, or the fifth month and the 25th day, maybe like a 525. Five. In the Islamic calendar, this is the uh, 
It's the second month, so it's the 25th day of the second month in the Islamic calendar, <coughs> which you know you could maybe connect with July 18, 2020. So that would be uh, you, 22 years. Then would take you to 11 September. 2001. Okay, so what has this date? What's significant about this date? Um, this is when the H quarters, the headquarters of the NATO was, I think they had inaugurated, you had Donald Trump there and you had Angela Merkel was amongst those who were there. And they had basically this here building. It's like a dome shape. And they had this here carpet going right up the middle of it, on either side. And you had this here like a grassy area, either side as well. So it was like a, a mirror image. On one side, you had two memorials. One was for the fall of the Berlin Wall on the ninth day of the eleventh month. Yeah, and it's in your notes too. You have a picture of it in your notes. Yeah, um, the last yeah. page of your first presentation. Mm -hmm. So it's occurred in nineteen eighty nine. So basically the beginning of this message. And then the other memorial, so they had there two two blocks of the Berlin Wall uh, was a memorial. And then they had a girder from one of the, the towers that fell on September 11th, uh, 2001. So 11th day of the ninth month, uh, 2001. So very much connecting to our message. And so that was just Picking up this year, 1150, here, the falling of mana, and also tying that um, to, uh, to July 18. So I just thought that was uh, an interesting connection that we can make uh, to that. So I'll just return to sharing. Time-wise, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's that uh, I'm sharing now, just basically how it looked, the 2,300 days with July 18 in the middle. You actually had another period of 23 days from September 2001, when Article 5 was invoked. So it wasn't just the memorials being set up, it was also a commemoration of Article 5. And Article 5 was the first time that was invoked by NATO. And what Article 5 is about is it says if one nation is attacked, the other nations will support that nation. And so you had some other nations like the UK, Australia, uh, being involved in, uh, with the, mar the armies of the United States going into Afghanistan um, in October in 2001. And interesting there also just the end 22 years is 264 months. And we can note that in the biblical calendar in July 18, the center date was uh, the 26th day of the fourth month. And that's uh, the proper picture of the, uh, the dedication of the Berlin Wall and, and 11 September 2001 memorial at the new NATO headquarters, Brussels, 25th of May 2017. And you see there, you have Twin Tower, the, sorry, the two blocks of the NATO, uh, the 
Berlin Wall, sorry. Yeah. And then uh, there is uh, the girder from one of the Twin Towers. Um, so I'm actually just going to review some things and add some things as well. So that was dating, we had dealt there with the ceasing of the mana in 40 years. We had previously discussed that the period of the judges is a period of, certainly within this year, 396 years from the Exodus. No, sorry, not from the entering into Canaan until the anointing of Saul. We had discussed a six year period from when they entered Canaan in 1493 to when the land was rest from war. And this year, 40 years and six years could be seen paralleled in a number of days in a mer type setting when Moses went to Mount Sinai for six days and then 40 days. But also, uh, there are mentions these here about a time of 450 years in Acts chapter 13, verse 20 says that when from the choosing of the fathers, there was going to be a space of 450 years until the land was going to be divided by lot. And so this has taken us to the time when Caleb is 85. The land was at rest by war, and that's in the year 1487 BC. And I had also mentioned um, there was going to be a period of 300 years. We'll, we'll look at that from when the ark is set up in Shiloh until it is then removed from there in the time when Eli dies. So we'll address that as well in, in future time. And uh, I'm just noting there that 1487, you have a period of 45 years relating to the number of years that, that Caleb then states that he had, trans that had taken place since he spied out the land. And then he's going to defeat them giants uh, at, at their time, and then the land is going to be declared at rest, and then they're going to divide the land by lot, and the tabernacle is going to be moved from Gilgal, when, which was when the, the, the manna began to fall, soon after it had been set up there, after they crossed the River Jordan. And then we can trace back 450 years to the choosing of the fathers, so that would take us to around the year uh, 1937 BC, and that was when uh, Isaac would have been like one year old. If it's going to be exactly 450 years, but it's saying about, so it could be relating to the time he's weaned or to the time that he was actually born. We discussed this here chiasm of 430 years being divided into 215 years either side. And I just want to uh, add some points concerning this here middle point. Um, so Levi here and Joseph are brothers, so the fourth generation in this here diagram, uh, there's an overlap, is what I'm saying. The, the end of the, so Joseph and Levi are the same generation, so there's actually seven generations brought to view there, but you can divide it into four and four. And in just noting there, that with the Exodus occurring in 1533 BC, we have them 14, 430 years beginning in 1963. And so the midpoint, 215 years from uh, 1963 BC is 1748 BC. And another observation, Joseph about their time was 39 years old. And this here, uh, there's a chronology that can be worked out that he had when he, he when he reunites I'll just go down I think it's uh, I have a diagram here so I'm discussing this here period where he unites with Jacob it's declared that uh, Jacob is then 130 years old when he meets Pharaoh I think that's in chapter 47 of Genesis I think verse 9, I'm not sure about that, but I think that's my memory of it. And that's um, two years into the, the famine of seven years. 
Before that, there was seven years of plenty. And that's when Jacob, sorry, Joseph is going to be made the Prime Minister of Egypt. And prior to that, there's a period of, so he's going to be 30 years old. So you just add the seven years of plenty, then the two years of dearth or famine until he meets with Jacob. You can see that uh, Joseph then would be 39 years old. So that's just clarifying that 39 years. And then he dies. We're told he dies at age 110. We find that in Genesis chapter 50. Just one of the last verses of that, uh, that, that book. And then the other end of the 215 years, we identify that Caleb was 39 years old at the time of the Exodus. And then when he's going to spy out the land, he's going to be 40 years old. So that's going to be over a year uh, from the Exodus. And then we don't know what age Caleb himself died. But uh, we know that Joshua then, he lived to 110 years old, so he's associated with Caleb. And so we have that pattern. And it's just interesting then, from when Abram left Haran, there's a period of 381 years to when Caleb was born. I just thought that was noteworthy. I not, haven't seen anything else to add to that. Um, we have a statement about the age of Joshua in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 511. Ellen White says, Before the distribution of the land had been entered upon, Caleb, accommodated by the heads of his tribe, came forward with a special claim. Except Joshua, Caleb was now the oldest man in Israel. So this quote occurs in the context of Caleb being 85 years old. It states that Joshua was the only Israelite older than Caleb, Therefore, he would have to be at least 86 years old. Joshua was 110 years old when he died. Therefore, at the most, he led Israel 24 years after this time and 30 years for him replacing Moses as God's chosen leader. This offers the potential for Joshua being 80 years old when he crossed the River Jordan. The same age as Moses when he had led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. So this chronology would place the history of the book of Joshua from 1493 BC to 1463 BC at its greatest extent. And this is a, a diagram of the 300 years of Judges 1126. And I've added here the 30 years relating to Joshua. And this is combined with uh, Gerhard Gertoz understanding of uh, the 80 years concerning Ehud. So he's going to say there's going to be 20 years of Ehud, and then there's going to be 20 years of Jabin, and uh, 40 years of Deborah Barak. So that's going to be a period of 80 years where the land rests. But he's applying that rest just to southern Israel. And it's going to be Jabin there. He's going to be primarily uh, occupying areas of um, oppressing Israel in the north, and that's going to be—he's going to be dealt with by Deborah and Barak. Um, but therefore, if that was going to be the case, uh, here you have uh, 1463 BC, and Joshua's going to die, and then you would have to have like 16 years then when the elders outlive Joshua when they die. So that would be that application of prophecy. I'm not too sure. It's a bit speculative, but as if we're not given the full information, enough information judges to know these things. We can, this is sort of the best uh, I can do. Um, I think time-wise, are we... Yeah, we're done. So I'll just close with prayer, and I'll continue on later. <coughs> Dear loving Heavenly Father, we just want to praise you. We give thanks for your love and mercy towards us. We give thanks that uh, we have faculties to serve you. We ask your presence to be amongst us and to 
empower us to do according to your will. And leave, give your words to Theodore as he seeks to present further light to us in the next presentation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.